everybody. Thank you for joining us for our discussion about using LIDAR for vegetation management. This is our 14th presentation in a series of informational webinars that uh, Mazer is very proud to present. Today, I'll be talking about uh, using LIDAR for vegetation management. All right, my name is Rob Dannenberg, and I'm the discipline leader for unmanned aviation for Mazer Consulting. Um, but today, we're going to discuss what is LIDAR, the benefits of using LIDAR for vegetation management, and data collection for tree trimming um, as an example project workflow. Obviously, LIDAR for vegetation management can go several different directions. We're going to keep this at a relatively high level, so it applies to um, the most of the audiences we can. But if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them, and we'll uh, address those at the end. So first, what is LIDAR? Well, LIDAR is an acronym for light detection and ranging. It consists generally of a laser scanner and because we're going to be talking about a mobile LIDAR type device, an initial, an initial measurement unit and a GNSS receiver. That basically lets the LIDAR know where it is in space and can calculate the distance and ranges from that. Um, LIDAR is an active measurement system based on time of flight as opposed to photogrammetry, which would be a passive system. Uh, the, one of the advantages of LIDAR is the multiple returns per pulse, and it can measure from treetops to the forest floor through vegetation with penetration. There's many different ways to employ a LIDAR sensor. Some of the different platforms out there would be vehicle-borne, i.e. a high rail truck, um, an actual truck on the road, or a marine vessel, i.e. a boat, or airborne platforms, traditional manned fixed wing or rotary wing, or unmanned um, aerial systems, depending on the application that you're actually using and the distance time and access to that area would be how you would employ the LIDAR sensor. Across the board, the LIDAR sensor is gonna work the same way though. Some benefits of using LIDAR is improved safety, repeatability, can be more cost effective and better accuracy than legacy methods. So one of the large problems with vegetation encroachment is it poses a risk to infrastructure and the surrounding areas. It can change from year to year and from season to season. Some current legacy methods used to detect uh, vegetation encroachment uh, that could cause issues with either the reliability of the utility network or the surrounding areas is to fly a helicopter over with somebody in the helicopter annotating a GPS position whenever they see something that could be an issue driving right-of-ways or in walking right-of-ways. As you can tell, some of those are not the most in or the most efficient or most accurate methods of doing it. We're gonna discuss how LIDAR can help solve some of those issues. One is to choose the areas that are of the most concern and scan them with LIDAR. One, it's repeatable and it's actionable. We can automate the workflow process um, after the scans are collected to be able to um, classify the LIDAR in different ways, which we'll um, be discussing shortly. It can be less expensive, and depending on the method um, of employment of the LIDAR, whether it's manned aircraft for very large long lines or areas to UAS for smaller, shorter segments where it would be cost prohibitive to use a manned aircraft, um, the cost benefit is there and has been um, analyzed by numerous uh, utilities in the industry. And it can also serve as a permanent re record of existing conditions at any point in time. So whenever you collect this data, not only are you collecting information for vegetation encroachment, you're getting additional information on your lines. So one example of additional information you can collect is actually modeling the power lines and the poles. Um, as I'm sure everyone on this uh, webinar is aware, Poles change, lines change. As maintenance happens, lines get replaced, you know, or poles need to be replaced and everything, some of that position changes. Also, the sway and the sag of the line. So the actual power line is gonna change its dimensions of where it is, depending on what the weather is, what the wind is, and what the load going through that line is. And understanding those conditions basically will give you um, the parameters for how close vegetation should be to your line before it could cause issues of reliability of that line. So here's a small video um, just identifying encroachments. So as you see, this is just a colorized point cloud flying down the line. The yellow boundary is the right-of-way barrier. The blue shaded lines are possible at-risk encroachments, and the red or purple color lines are actual encroachments that are causing a risk to the line at this time. 
Um, this was an automated classification based off of center of the power line. And these measurements can be dictated for specific KV of lines, specific height of lines, or specific types of vegetation. This is just an example of what we used for a specific project. Here's another example of a screenshot of using a 20 foot diameter circle around um, the actual pivot point of a line or where it's attached to a pole to show any encroachment um, onto that area. And again, that can be created as a tunnel to follow down the power lines to show any encroachment on that line or even surrounding areas of areas that could become an encroachment. On the left, you see a normal Google Street View that you can get on Google Earth um, and take a view. And you can see the power poles there and some of the vegetation out there. And here's the LIDAR on the right side, where you can see the LIDAR is actually colorized and what kind of looks like a red blob there. But that is the vegetation that is causing an immediate risk to um, those lines right there. Using LiDAR to collect the static can actually be visualized or uh, produced in multiple different ways. One of the easiest ways to view this is just in a simple map view. So this is that same area where you have the lines actually modeled. You can see the individual lines. The power poles are circled in red. And the yellow is where the vegetation is um, encroached on of the specific parameters that were needed for this project. You can export these encroachments into a tabular format using any coordinate system you'd like, i.e. state plane or latitude and longitude. But quantifying the amount of encroachment can also help uh, utility companies or other interested parties in being able to cost effectively plan their operations to reduce this vegetation. Obviously, if you have one vegetation encroachment um, on a line or a span, there's most likely other ones near the area. And if you wanted to mobilize a crew to be able to trim back you know, the trees cut the grass or whatever other encroachments are there and identify them, it wouldn't be cost effective to just go hit one area at one time. So having a large area collection so you can um, plan those mobilizations and those operations more cost effectively can be very important. Using the data, you can uh, prepare work orders. Um, as areas are identified for vegetation clearing, GIS asset management applications can be used to track work orders associated with any areas needing to be cleared. Those mobile field assignments can then be linked to the field for before and after photos, comments from the field um, work to set reoccurring field work orders along areas uh, that have been identified as high frequency growth maintenance or any other comments that the crews in the field see. Using a mobile application to assist field crews. So while they're in the field, they can actually pull it up on a tablet phone something like that to be able to see the areas that um, they should be targeting and make any comments that they have throughout these areas. Okay, so how can LiDAR help? One, safety. Um, it gives you the ability to survey target areas with less risk to field crews. Um, faster and more cost-effective data collection. Uh, you can collect large areas and actually automate a lot of that data processing. Depending how you control that data during collection, you can use that data for additional information, i.e. modeling the lines to be able to calculate sway and sag and identify more areas for vegetation encroachment. Um, it can be repeatable from year to year or season to season. One of the biggest challenges that we've seen with utility companies is as they're planning their budgets for vegetation encroachment and vegetation management for the next year, they're trying to do that based off of conditions of this year. And if you limit to just what the right of way is, they're not going to be able to predict what could enter that right of way in the future. So being able to collect the data outside of that right of way a little bit and give um, the ability to predict where and what is going to come in over the next year can help um, identify operations and budgets that are going to be critical moving forward. You have increased data accuracy. The fact that LIDAR is collecting anywhere between eight and hundreds of points per meter will give you. A, a bigger picture of what you have going. Um, if you just have aerial photographs, for example, you might see the top of the vegetation and you might be able to see encroachments coming in 
you know, to the side of the power lines, but can you really tell how thick the vegetation is underneath them and what's growing up into the power lines underneath? Another advantage of LIDAR is being able to pierce through that, that vegetation and actually getting the quantity of what that is. It's an unobtrusive way to collect the data. You don't have the low-flying manned helicopter potentially flying over uh, right of ways near housing and causing um, noise issues and that. Um, you can do this from manned aircraft at, at a very high altitude. Um, you also don't need to be on the areas as much driving through to detect this if you're in wetlands or protected environmental areas. Robust data sets that can be used for multiple purposes. Um, again, one of the cost savings is if you're collecting the LiDAR data for vegetation management, you can use that for multiple different uses um, in that single collect, which is saving money opposed to having to collect four different sets of data to do that. And year-round collection um, is possible due to the ability to penetrate um, tree canopy. So I know this has been relatively short, um, but we want to go right into the questions and answers so we can target any uh, specific questions we have on. Maria? Hi. Oh, thanks, Rob. Um, yeah, we have a few questions. Um, this question is from Mike, and he asked, uh, what other uses can this type of collection be used for? Um, so, as I mentioned during the presentation, LIDAR collection can be used for any spatial um, need. So, uh, for example, if you can see on this image to the left, not only are you collecting the tower, um, the towers that are there, so you can model out the towers, you're actually collecting the line data. If we add a weather station and the ability to collect that, we can actually model uh, using PLS CAD model those lines to detect sway and sag. Uh, you can see other obstructions in the area, maps slightly beyond right away to see what might not be an issue today, but might be an issue six months from now or a year from now. Um, you can also see the density of that LIDAR that you can actually see the insulators, guide wires, and some of the other information on the tower. So this can actually be used um, for utility companies for an asset management uh, standpoint too. Uh, if we add imagery to that, you can use that for inspection purposes as well. Uh, thank you, Rob. A uh, question from Jeff. Can you use aerial and mobile LIDAR on the same project? Absolutely. Uh, one of the nice things about LIDAR and depending on what manufacturers and everything you're using, but um, data fusion is uh, a very common thing that we do here at Mazer Consulting and I'm sure other companies do as well. But um, merging mobile LIDAR or terrestrial LIDAR and airborne LIDAR um, is a very feasible thing to do and we do on multiple projects. Um, it's all about choosing the right tool and how you're going to collect that LIDAR data for what you need. And sometimes an airborne LIDAR data set is not giving you something that you might need from the ground, but it's going to cover more area. So being able to specify, you know, a mobile LIDAR down a road surface um, or in a heavy populated area like that to collect that data and the airborne LIDAR to, you know, go beyond that right away where the mobile LIDAR can't see is a very doable um, thing. Thank you, Rob. A uh, question here from Kevin. Uh, we have dealt with LIDAR data sets. How can we help manage the size of these data sets? To totally understand that question and I can appreciate that. Some LIDAR data sets can be very large, um, which can make them a challenge to deal with. Uh, one of the ways that you can deal with that is if you're an entity that is getting this data collected and really all you care about is the vegeta vegetation encroachment or those pieces we can actually provide that data in shape files and those map views and other gis type databases so you don't have to deal with the hundreds of millions and billions of points that might be coming through the lidar data we also have the ability to host that data that if you want a, a closer picture of the ability to do that, but don't necessarily have the hard drive or, or network ability to do that. You can use those shape files and those map applications, click on an area, tie in to, you know, a network of where that data is being stored and just view that smaller section that, you know, you're trying to get more information on opposed to having the entire data set. Um, I think that should answer that question. Okay, yes, uh, sounds good, Rob. Um, we actually don't have any other questions right now, so um, do you want to leave us with any final remarks or comments? Yeah, so this was obviously a very high level and, and short like um, lessons learned, but if anybody does have any questions or want to go more into detail on any specific applications, please um, feel free to contact myself or contact survey webinars at maserconsulting.com. We'll make sure those questions get to the right people and get answered. Or if you have a specific application that you'd like to learn more on, we can set up a one-on-one -on -one, uh, lunch and learn to 
to discuss discuss your specific applications. Um, also, in closing, to um, if no other questions come up, is please. Uh, Go to mazerconsulting.com forward slash events. You'll see our entire webinar schedule, what's coming up over the next few weeks, and that is consistently being updated. If you have any recommendations or questions on specific topics you would like us to cover, you can also send those to survey webinars at mazerconsulting.com. I want to thank everybody for joining, um, and please don't hesitate to reach out if you have any other questions. Mm -hmm.